Hello, welcome. I'm Elaine Sanders, the Adult Programming Coordinator for the Mark Twain Library. And I'm thrilled to have all of you joining us on Valentine's night. We appreciate that. And tonight we are trying to stay warm and dream of spring. And it's a pleasure to have the Garden Club with us to talk about the many pollinators we can look forward to welcoming back to our gardens. So I would like to thank the Garden Club for generously opening their membership programs to the public during COVID. We've enjoyed and learned so much over last year and I'm thrilled that they are doing it again this winter. It's always a pleasure when the library has the opportunity to work with the Garden Club. So we are a large group tonight and the audience has been muted, but how we do want to hear your questions. So please feel free to type them in at any time into the Q&A function. And um, we've saved plenty of time at the end to answer those questions. And the Q&A function is down at the bottom in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, and so please put your questions in there. And we are recording tonight's program. So you can look for it in about a week on the library's YouTube channel and the Garden Club will have a copy also. Now I'd like to turn the evening over to Jennifer Weibel, um, Weibel um, of the Reading Garden Club. Jennifer. Hi, I'm so happy to be introducing our neighbor, Victor Damasi this evening. As I'm sure you know, he's a lepidopterist and he's gonna take us on a virtual sunny day walk through his pollinator meadow in Reading. And with cold weather like this, that sounds like a treat to me. Victor is an extremely active member of the pollinator pathway. He was a wetland conservation officer in Reading for 20 years and is presently a curatorial affiliate at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History in New Haven. He busies himself with preserving open space in town and preserving butterflies in the museum. His field work with butterflies contributed almost a thousand citations to the recently published Connecticut Butterfly Atlas. He has contributed articles to scientific publications and his mark and recapture studies with swallowtail butterflies was recently cited in the book, Swallowtails of the Americas. During the pandemic, he's been doing a pollinator survey of two meadows in Reading. Victor, we're anxious to learn more about the pollinators we all are so dependent on. I turn it over to you. Okay, we ready to go here? You're ready good to, to go, go, Victor. Okay, well, tonight we're going to talk about uh, pollinators, pollinator party, and uh, we're going to cover somewhat about some biology, some interesting biology about insects. It's a little heavy on butterflies because uh, that has been my thing, although I'm getting more into bees recently. So let's see here. This is the uh, pollinator pathway who's kind of uh, pushing my uh, act these days, trying to restore native vegetation to uh, Connecticut. Uh, a lot of us have surely been alarmed uh, nature-wise at the lawning that's going on in our state. Uh, I know since moving to Reading 40 years ago, I've seen a lot of really prime uh, meadows uh, turned into front lawns or back lawns or whatever. So we're gonna talk about the consequences of that and what we can do to maybe change things for the better. Now, in order for me to talk about such a big subject, I think it's important for me to uh, establish my authority. And I'm gonna have to use a little bit of uh, you know, uh, genetics and uh, genealogy to do that. So the story kind of starts back in old England and the English traveled frequently to Italy where they were amused by the activities of the Italians. And they came home and uh, looked at these people starting to collect insects all around and compared them to the Italians, hence the word macaroni, which really wasn't a, um, I, I, I can't say it's a nice thing to be called, but you do get used to it after a while. So here's the uh, fly catching macaroni in old England. And just to show you how some things, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Here's a modern macaroni. My name is Italian descent, Damasi. And uh, here I am catching flies, a monarch butterfly in this case. I didn't keep this one, I let it go. So don't worry about it. And my spouse and I, Rowanna, we've uh, been very involved in entomology since our university days. And we've traveled uh, and collected over uh, many areas, East Africa. Here we are on way to South America, crossing, crossing the uh, 
island of Montserrat with a erupting volcano. And I'll tell you, this was, this was of my international travels. This was one of the spectacular moments. Uh, but today we're gonna stay right here in Reading in my backyard because the Amazon is truly fascinating, but I think the whole thing is, and what we'll learn today, you've got some really fascinating things going on right in the backyard. Uh, this is my house here in West Reading. Uh, some of you uh, might be familiar with it. And uh, I was sold this house when I was first getting married. I was looking for a house to rent at the time. I ended up buying this, but I went around Reading with Marilyn Sloper and she patiently showed me many, many houses for rent, none of which really uh, suited me. And she said, finally getting a little irritated by afternoon, she said, Victor, I've got one more. It's a real dog, but maybe you'd like it. So I drove up this driveway and uh, been in the same dog ever since. And this is what the backyard looks like. And that's what I saw when I drove up the driveway. And uh, this is a wonderful uh, post agricultural meadow. It was probably forest 200 years ago or something before this area was settled by European descent. But uh, it has been a tremendous uh, place for my entomological activities. My wonderful spouse who has traveled with me all over the world uh, is pictured here out the attic window, Rowanna Matowski, and uh, just a, a wonderful place. In the first year I lived here, I found a very rare species in Connecticut. And since then I've cataloged several more rare species right in this uh, one little area. So it's, it's unique. This is the fauna of uh, Connecticut. This is the butterfly fauna. This is about 50% of our fauna. We have about 120 species of butterflies in, the, in uh, Connecticut. And over the 45 years that we've lived here on Simpog, uh, we've logged about a, a, a half of the uh, butterflies found in the state. So it's truly a very rich area. I'm sure some of you might recognize some of these butterflies from your garden. So tonight the subject is we're gonna talk about uh, pollination. And pollination is a very important process that uh, even entomologists haven't really paid enough attention to up till now, but we're getting uh, more concerned about this every day. And just to go back to a little uh, bit of uh, uh, mating, uh, this is mating lesson here, not mating, but uh, pollinate, uh, pollination. Uh, you see the female butterfly, uh, the butterfly goes to the uh, uh, anthers, which have this little yellow powder on it, usually yellow powder, pollen, and it brushes off on the insect. And when the insect uh, travels to the stigma, that's the female part of the flower, it rubs off some of the pollen and the pollen uh, goes down as sperm to fertilize the uh, plant. And down at the bottom, you can see the ovule, that's the, uh, where, where the seed will come. Basically, that's the equivalent of the egg in, in humans. And there's other ways, uh, insect pollination is very important, but there's also pollen that's caught by the wind. And so some plants are pollinated by wind pollination without the aid of any uh, insects or other, other uh, pollinator type agents whatsoever. We know this pollen, okay? Uh, here's my driveway in uh, maybe May when the trees have been letting off their wind, uh, wind carried pollen. And here's more of it. It can be really in certain years, uh, it's bad for your allergy and it's bad for your car. You have to wash this stuff off and it, it can be damaging to painted surfaces if it's left on. Now, I don't want you to get uh, uh, um, wind pollination confused with wind dispersal. There are two different things that people often uh, lock together. Some things like the common dandelion that grows in your front yard is dispersed by wind. That means that when the seeds are formed, each seed has a little parachute and the uh, wind comes along and blows these seeds uh, around to their, their new place. Okay, we're gonna talk more. Our focus today is not on the wind pollination, but on the uh, mostly insect uh, aided pollination. And here's a, a female bee. Uh, most of the worker bees are the work bees are females that are doing the pollinating work and they have uh, specialized organisms for collecting the 
uh, pollen. And here, this bee is just loaded with a big nutritious uh, batch of pollen that uh, she's bringing back to the hive to, uh, to you know, help the young feed them. Now, you know, people have a lot of confusion. I mean, bees are not the only pollinators. There's just so much emphasis on bees, but it's totally wrong. There's a lot of different agents out there uh, mixing and getting pollen around uh, from anther to uh, uh, stam stamen to, uh, and here is a group of different uh, animals and agents that can help uh, pollination. They can pick up pollen from one flower and carry it to another. Uh, you see at the top bats, they're very, especially big in the tropics. In Connecticut, we actually have mosquitoes that can pollinate plants, something that surprises people. Other things like the beetles and the flies, they're frequent at, uh, at feeding at flowers and uh, having some you know, pollen on them. If you take one and look at it close, you'll see uh, some pollen. So uh, ants, moths, butterflies, wasps, all these things can be effective uh, pollinators. But of course, the bees are the real uh, workhorses of the pollinating world. But we'll, we'll take a look at some of that stuff. So this is how it kind of breaks down. Uh, we have about 75% uh, of our, uh, our, our plants are pollinated and reproduce uh, with the aid of insects and the other agents that we just discussed. The, uh, about 25% of our plants are uh, wind pollinated. So uh, what this means in simple math is if you get rid of all the pollinators, you are eventually going to get rid of the 75% of the plants uh, species that we have out in our backyard. So it's very important that we start paying attention to our pollinators. And we'll talk about why, how, we, how we're not paying proper attention a little later on and what we can do to fix that. Uh, here we are at the uh, dog, uh, my dog that Marilyn uh, rented to me and then I purchased and have lived happily ever after, mostly. And here we are looking over a uh, red monarda, a beautiful flowering plant, a wonderful agent if you're trying to increase uh, your nectar sources in your, in your meadow or garden or around the house or whatever. These are just absolutely lovely and they're very uh, resistant. Deer don't eat them that I know and they grow like weeds. You stick them in a patch and the patch Ex expands all its own. So I particularly favor Monarda because I'm one of the easy way outs when it comes to uh, managing my landscape around my, uh, my meadow. Uh, the red flowers. Now, one of the things about pollinating, uh, pollinating agents such as birds, uh, uh, hummingbirds are important pollinators here in Connecticut and uh, especially in the tropics. Uh, they uh, get their bill into these deep flowers like cardinal flower, one of our really outstanding, beautiful red flowers. These uh, birds uh, particularly favor uh, red flowers, and they love the Monarda also that we had just uh, looked at. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, a lot of these insects, in fact, all that I've studied really, they favor certain flowers. So um, in order to have flowers reproducing the plants that they come from, you have to have the pollinator present. And sometimes they can be very, very specialized. For instance, in Bethel, we have a very rare plant and it's pollinated by a bee that is also extremely rare. Uh, the bee has just been uh, located uh, one or two seasons ago in Connecticut. So season, we have plenty to learn about our entomology if we take a time to go out there. Here we see a spice bush swallowtail, one of the really, one of our really spectacular mega butterflies. And uh, here, this uh, one, it's a male, is has a pollen dusting on its uh, wing. So you can see how when it goes to the next lily, it might pollinate it, probably will. Again though, one of the things you wanna know about pollinators is they specialize in different types of flowers. Now, my favorite group of flowers, and uh, Jennifer will have more. We'll have more to say this at the end of the show, but uh, the milkweeds and the milkweeds are uh, really uh, good plants. Uh, a lot of them grow on their own. If they get the right spot, they start growing on their own. We uh, 
grow four species of milkweeds in our meadow and around our house in West Reading. And I do have seeds that I've collected uh, that I can distribute to a limited number of people who request them. And I've got directions how to plant these if you want to start your own meadow. Um, these plants, last year, my daughter uh, got this program underway and we gave seeds to over uh, 100 different uh, people in Connecticut and land trusts and, uh, and, and, and mailed seeds to over six different uh, states, uh, individuals in those states. So it's a wonderful program. At the end, pay attention and we'll get you some seeds if you're doing some uh, green thumb activities around your house, which I urge. Uh, we'll talk about this a little more, the milkweeds, but the milkweeds, uh, the thing that's nice, the nectar is great for all sorts of pollinating insects, but the plant itself is the food for the monarch butterflies. And uh, we have a number of uh, species of milkweeds growing here. Like I said, I have four in my meadow. Here we have the swamp milkweed, a uh, wonderful uh, milkweed that tolerates moist to uh, semi-dry sites. And we have here uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, this is, I, I said that wrong. Huh? Oh. Wait a second. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, um, swamp milkweed. The last one we saw was the purple milkweed, which is very rare in Connecticut and very rare everywhere. And we do have a few seeds of uh, um, purple milkweed available. Uh, those would only be for the most ardent, uh, experienced gardeners because they need a kind of special care to get started. But uh, the other milkweeds, especially the common milkweed, it's you can uh, put them up in a mud ball, throw them around, and they'll, they usually take on their own. Here's the uh, purple milkweed again. Absolutely beautiful uh, milkweed plant. And uh, again, good food for the monarch butterflies. And the nectars are uh, very, the nectar, nectaries in the flowers are wonderful for a, a bunch of different uh, pollinators. Okay, now well, one of the things we've been doing, there's a lot of interest in pollinators recently. If you work in the field of entomology and, and stray there and check it out, uh, you'll notice that over the last few years, there's really been a great increase in pollinators because we are losing them. They are declining and we're worried about uh, maintaining the vegetation in our natural state uh, uh, because of not having enough pollinators. And one thing when I'm talking about pollinators, I know you know about bees and stuff. There's so many more uh, bees and wild bees in Connecticut uh, than just the domestic bees. So uh, when we say bees, we're talking about all the different wild bees that might be out there and they might be visiting a plant like this, uh, Joe Pieweed. And uh, here is a, one of our local people, Sammy Riccio, wonderful young woman who is uh, now working out in Utah on birds of prey. But she uh, helped me two years ago. We did uh, a, a survey, a pollinator survey of two very promising meadows in Redding. We did the um, uh, uh, Highstead Arboretum and we did my meadow in my wife and our meadow in uh, West Reading. And here she is out in that uh, tall summer vegetation uh, chasing some pollinators. The collections that we made uh, are going to the Peabody Museum at Yale to make a permanent record. Now it turned out that, you know, with pollinators, there is, uh, there have been a lot of pollinators uh, collected in Connecticut over the last, uh, 150 years or whatever the, the, the age of our Peabody Museum collection is. And there are other pollinating insect specimens in the National Museum and stuff from Connecticut. But to my knowledge, no one ever really did a study where they took one meadow and followed it all the way through the season. Uh, most of the specimens result from a field trip here or a field trip there, two days, three days, and what turns up. So. Uh, we made a concentrated effort to be out there once a week uh, for a good collecting to uh, make these collections. Uh, I also uh, had uh, Lucas Karras, a very promising young stir. Uh, he was 13 here at the time, and uh, he helped me with my meadow, and I, I took the uh, chance to uh, teach him about entomology and how to prepare uh, specimens for the collection and everything. Lucas is going to be a really promising 
uh, entomologist. He comes to our entomology lunch, our Zoom entomology lunches every Thursday at the Peabody Museum, and he just talks moth talk like the best of them. So uh, this kid, he's he's got the uh, he, he he's got the hots for bugs, and and he's doing it. So wonderful. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're talking about with the monarda, that red monarda that has a very deep uh, uh, flower is the hummingbird moths. And you might've seen these in your garden. And I always get a call every season, somebody's got tiny hummingbirds at their uh, flowers. Well, it's, it's actually a moth. Uh, there's five different kinds of moths in the genus Homeris, and uh, they are common. Uh, three of them are common in redding in the summer at plants such as especially that red monarda bee balm and uh, the uh, cardinal flower. Now uh, we see some of the, the bees are, I mean, when you start to look at these things under microscopes and everything, they are totally fascinating, very hairy, very difficult to identify if you're learning how to uh, identify them to their species, their scientific names and stuff, because all the hair really obscures uh, looking at the bodies uh, closely. So you have to kind of work around that. And here that is uh, again here, uh, close up. Here's another species of, of bee with the uh, pollen sac, the ascopa uh, with a lot of hairs on it. You can see those yellow, uh, let me see if I have a cursor here. The yellow hairs on the leg are uh, what will pick up uh, the uh, pollen from uh, the anthers as it as it goes from flower to flower. And the different bees have a lot of different types of hairs. So uh, uh, it's very important in the identification where the placement of hairs are. Some will have very hairy abdomens and some will have very hairy heads. And uh, so having a beard and everything, I'm very sympathetic to their hairiness. I've always sought that. Now, when we're, we're talking about butterfly gardening, that's a word that uh, comes up. And, you know, for the most part, we're not really talking, when we talk about butterfly gardening, we're not talking about kind of traditional uh, gardens like this, which with a lot of nursery plants. This can be a source of pollen and pollination, but uh, the problem is generally with a, uh, an area like this, the people have used a lot of pesticides, and uh, the plants are planted yearly. So it's not really a natural reproducing landscape. When we talk about butterfly uh, gardening, we're really talking about landscape management uh, to a degree and keeping the natural world going, especially not letting it be overrun by uh, invasive plants and stuff, which we'll visit in a few minutes. So uh, we gotta do our uh, biology and uh, here we are, the butterfly life cycle. We're gonna look at the butterfly today. And at the very top, we see the uh, eggs of the butterfly. The eggs hatch out to be caterpillars or larvae, and the larvae feed on plants. Now, the thing that you need to know about butterflies, similar to the pollinating beef groups, is that these, butter, these caterpillars specialize on certain plants, like the monarch butterfly, the caterpillars will only eat milkweed. Uh, other, other butterflies uh, will, like this tiger swallowtail, a large yellow and black swallowtail, you might know from your garden, they feed on tulip tree and they feed on um, a black cherry. Now, you know, they need the nectar to reproduce and they need the food plant to eat as a youngster, so to speak. So the mosaic of Connecticut with forests with cherry and tulip tree and fields with flowers where they can get nectar are the perfect one-two punch for swallowtail butterflies to build healthy populations. Uh, when those butterflies have, when those caterpillars have eaten to their satiation and gone through their changes, usually you can say mostly about six weeks, they change into chrysalis. The chrysalis is at the bottom. Uh, pupa, it's called a pupa, it's a cocoon in moths. And the chrysalises are fascinating things all in themselves. The problem with the chrysalis, it's gotta be hidden well, so some mice or something else doesn't come along and uh, eat it. And then uh, at the end, it emerges as a butterfly. And you know the butterfly's purpose is one thing, and that is to reproduce. 
Uh, and so butterflies not going to hang around for weeks and months, most of them anyway. They just want to get out there and uh, and get a mate and and lay their eggs and be off. Most uh, if a swallowtail lives for a week, it's doing well. And those swallowtails you see in your garden are most likely not going to be there tomorrow because some bird made it a meal. The birds love swallowtails. They are just wonderful food, uh, caterpillars and, uh, and and the adults. So the eggs are absolutely fascinating in their own right. You can identify species of butterflies by their eggs. This is an upside down photo. This is on the bottom of a leaf and this is the eggs of the comma butterfly and uh, absolutely stunning, hard to find. It's not easy, the butterflies really don't want you or predators to find their eggs. So, um, cause the eggs are very good eating for things like ants and stuff like that. And so you can tell the species. Now, being at the Peabody Museum has been a fascinating experience for me. And uh, one of the high points was when my colleague and uh, curatorial uh, collections manager there, Larry Gall, uh, discovered some ancient eggs. They were cleaning some dinosaur bones at the museum and they were brushing dust off it. And they put the dust under the uh, electron microscope and uh, they found moth eggs from the Jurassic period. I mean, those eggs were around when the butterfly, when the uh, dinosaurs were around. That today, to, to date, is the oldest known of uh, Lepidoptera eggs known. So it was really exciting to be there when Larry found this and, and just in the dust of what the uh, paleontology department was throwing away. They didn't know they had such treasures. And then uh, we're coming to the caterpillar. And, uh, you know, this is the caterpillar. This thing is about bigger than your thumb. This is the pipevine swallowtail caterpillar, very rare uh, bug in Connecticut. Uh, it feeds on Dutchman's pipe. Now, this butterfly was uh, more about in Victorian times because Dutchman's pipe was planted. Uh, it's a climbing vine that was planted popularly around Victorian um, uh, trellises and stuff. And you have the food plant, the butterfly is going to come around and put some eggs on it. So uh, thinking about those things, I got some uh, some pipe vines and I put three of them in my yard and they grew wild over the years. And every year I would go out and look for pipe vine caterpillars, uh, knowing that unlikely to find them. And then one day I'm given a walk at my, uh, at my meadow. I get butterfly walks there for different uh, pollinator paths and stuff like that. And there's this little kid and we're walking along and I was explaining to people how I never get caterpillars and I'm always disappointed. And the kid goes, there's caterpillars all over the Dutchman's pipe. And sure enough, we counted more than a hundred. I mean, I couldn't believe it. This kid finds these caterpillars that I've been looking for for years. So you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, and they were there one year, uh, more than a hundred caterpillars. And then we never, uh, saw the adult butterflies or we never saw caterpillars again. So uh, this is very variable what uh, comes and goes in the butterfly world. Here's a beautiful example of the monarch butterfly. It has just been a, a chrysalis and uh, you know it's, it's uh, now emerging as an adult butterfly. It's gonna climb out on a branch or something and blow those wings up and fly away. Uh, absolutely wonderful uh, example of nature's greatest treasure. And you know, the bird people all make a big deal out of birds. They fly here and they go there. Think about metamorphosis. It is incredible. If you take an egg of a butterfly, it turns into a caterpillar, that caterpillar chomps along, and then it goes into the chrysalis. And in a couple of days, it completely changes and if you squish that chrysalis, which I did when I was ki a kid, uh, it's just black gunk. I mean, there's no indication of any animal. And, uh, you know, and then a couple of days later, it emerges as a butterfly. Now, if you were came from Mars and you had the job to talk about life on Earth, would you ever have be able to associate a caterpillar with a butterfly? It doesn't make sense. I mean, most of the things on Earth are you know, the little ones look like little versions of the big ones. Little kids look like uh, adults. You could easily associate them. So this is an absolutely uh, marvelous uh, phenomena in nature. 
And how does that genetic, uh, you know, determination continue as this thing eats plants, turns into a chrysalis, and then completely reorganizes itself into a butterfly? Truly amazing if you take the time to think about it. And here it is as a chrysalis. Uh, this is a swallowtail chrysalis, and swallowtails can, uh, can change their color to be, uh, you know, whatever their surrounding is. They want to be camouflaged or cryptic, as they call, as we call it. And uh, this one is looking like a, a dead stick. And it could also be very bright green if it was in in a, in a bunch of foliage. And here's the uh, final result: is a uh, a butterfly, the adult butterfly. And again, that adult butterfly is only here to live for a few days, find a mate, and put its eggs down. It's not here to live a life. I mean, people call me up, they've got a butterfly, and what can they do to make it live? I mean, that thing is going to be toast in a few days, no matter what way you cut it. Now, this is an interesting uh, species here. As I was saying, the caterpillars are specialists on different plants. This butterfly, uh, the giant swallowtail, bigger than any of our other swallowtails we have here, hence the name giant. It feeds on uh, uh, xanthus xylem or mountain uh, prickly ash. And uh, it is uh, not really been known from Connecticut. Uh, and what happened is in the turn of the century, um, there was, or these butterflies did get established around Greenwich and stuff. And there's been a colony reported in central Connecticut from around the 1950s. But generally, it's been absent. Recently, it's been reappearing in Connecticut in large numbers. Everybody's reporting it. I have not seen the adult, which really gets me crazy. Uh, I hate it when people call me up and say they've got a bunch of them in their backyard and I don't have any. So um, that can be a little irritating. But let's look at the biology of what's happening with this. This butterfly feeds on a plant. The caterpillar feeds on a plant. And the plant, uh, mountain ash, is very susceptible to um, frost. And when the first frost, I'm sure you've seen this in your yard, when the first frost comes, certain plants just turn to black mush and wilt. And that's what happens to uh, mountain ash. So if the caterpillars are feeding, uh, they have just been stripped of their meal and they're gonna die and they're not gonna reproduce. They're not gonna go through the winter and emerge as uh, butterflies to uh, continue the reproduction. And in recently, in recent years, what's happening is that we're losing that September frost. We haven't had a frost in September since, I don't know, 30 years, 20 years, whatever. So these uh, butterflies have established them in Connecticut. They're moving northward and they have become, uh, they're becoming regular members of our fauna, which is, it's an exciting butterfly to have in your, uh, in your backyard. And the uh, last year for the first time, my daughter located about 13 larvas on one of her root plants that uh, grow around her patio in Redding. So we're hoping we get some adults uh, this year. Uh, Larry, uh, La uh, Lori Heiss has been seeing them over in a cross meadow, has reported them to me. So now uh, one of the points I'm making here is that, you know, if the butterflies need special plants and the more kinds of plants you have, the more kinds of butterflies you can have. Here I am in French Guiana in a, uh, in, in a part of the Amazon forest. And on one acre of this forest, you cannot usually find the same plant twice. That's how many different kinds of plants you have in this forest. In Connecticut, you go out in the forest and you take like a white oak on an acre, you'll have 10 white oaks. You'll have 15 uh, ash trees. You'll have 15 birch. So uh, this is part of why the tropics are such a diverse uh, place for uh, insects and other animals because this, the vegetation that they're feeding on is so, uh, so many different species. This is, uh, this is where uh, gardeners and butterfly gardeners part ways. I go out and I see this plant in my garden and I go, what's feeding on that? And I get all excited because I think I got a new kind of butterfly coming or, or moth. My, uh, my, your, your typical gardener goes out and sees this and they're reaching for the uh, spray bottle or something to uh, make sure they kill all the bugs. So this is kind of a new uh, idea we want to get used to is that uh, th seeing this type of thing is shows you that it's a healthy place. And we're going to talk about this relationship a little more in depth. 
This was a butterfly uh, when I first moved to Reading. I had a colony of these uh, near, near my house. Uh, this is the West Virginia white. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, this is oh, like the white butterfly I see eating my cabbage and stuff. No, it's not the cabbage butterfly. This is the West Virginia white. It's a cousin, cousin of that, those cabbage butterflies. Cabbage butterflies were introduced from Europe in about 1860. And in fact, we have the first specimen collected in North America uh, in Maine uh, from back then. It's in the Peabody collection. And from there, the, uh, the um, white butterfly the, the, has, has expanded all over North America. They're common all the way from here to California. Uh, this is the West Virginia white, a uh, North American cousin that was already here. And this butterfly occurs in a very special habitat in very deep forest, a uh, mature forest that has um, maple trees and things like that. Uh, you feel kind of like you're in the North Woods. And on the bottom of that forest grows a plant. Here's the caterpillar of the West Virginia white, and it's feeding on its plant uh, toothwort. And the toothwort plant grows only in these deep forests, and it's a member of the cabbage family. You never know it. It doesn't look like cabbage, but it is uh, biologically a member of the cabbage family, and the West Virginia white feeds on it. It's... Uh, its cousin there, the uh, uh, cabbage moth, feeds on all the different members of the cabbage family uh, indiscriminately. And of course, things like you have in your garden, like cabbage and Brussels sprouts, it's, it's, it's a pest species. Some places like California, it's an agricultural pest species. And uh, here we have a plant called garlic mustard. Now this plant appeared in my garden or my backyard about 30 years ago. And it was one or two here and there, and I was pretty excited because I always like to see a new plant with new possibilities. And it turns out the garlic mustard is a member of the mustard cabbage family. It's an invader from Central Asia, and it's kind of come to Reading. And this is the flower, the white flower you see all over your little forests, uh, the edges of forests and stuff, and into your yard in April and May. Incidentally, it's an easy plant to weed at that time. If you have them, they just, the whole root system will come out with a pull. So that's the time to control uh, this type of a plant if you are so inclined, which I am. Now, what the problem is, is here's, here's what uh, garlic mustard does quickly. And okay, uh, well, let me see. Okay. Okay, well, uh, we're gonna go, sorry, but. Okay, so here we are. We're with this uh, field of garlic mustard that we have growing. Now, it, talking about the West Virginia white butterfly that lives in these little enclaves in the middle of the forest on its toothwort, it turns out the toothwort is also a member of the cabbage family. Uh, and although, as, as I said, it doesn't look anything like cabbage. So what has happened and what happened to my colony in Reading, uh, they were using a lot of sand on the roads and the sand washes into these little streams and it washed into the middle of Topstone Park in a very remote area, nowhere near a forest, uh, near, nowhere near a road. And there in the middle of the forest, this little sandbar developed from this road wash. And what grows wonderfully on little sandbars is this garlic mustard. And what happens is the West Virginia white comes along, it tastes the plant, it takes its claws, its little uh, claws at the end of its legs and it scrapes the leaf, this is the female, and it gets the right chemical cue and it lays an egg. Unfortunately, the uh, little caterpillars cannot feed on the garlic mustard, even though it is in the cabbage family. So they starve to death. And in a short period of time, uh, seemingly this uh, biology of the uh, garlic mustard invading uh, West Virginia white sites has caused the almost complete loss of it in our state. My colony winked out at least, uh, I had a couple colonies in Reading uh, and they were always small colonies, just maybe uh, you know, on an on a April day when they fly, uh, around their little areas that you'd see, if you saw a tent, it was a big year for them. So they were never really super common. Now we're gonna talk a little about the monarch butterfly. 
And uh, the monarch butterfly is uh, uh, broken to some degree. We hear a lot about it. It's a very charismatic butterfly. And uh, we want to see what's going on with this butterfly because the biology is uh, interesting. And of course, this is really this is really one of the main butterflies everybody knows, the kids are talking about and everything. So what does the monarch do? Well, the monarch is a migratory species. Uh, some butterflies are migratory and they go one place and come back later. Not many, but a few like the monarch go following the red lines, they go all the way to a small area in Mexico, uh, a small mountain range of very thick uh, fir forests where they all alight on the trees. There are thousands, millions of monarch butterflies. So many that uh, in the old days when there was like 6 billion in Mexico, they would uh, actually break the uh, branches of some of the trees. Why do they go there? Because the temperature gets very cold in winter, but it never really freezes. So they can go into kind of like a hibernation. And uh, if you walk through, the area where the butterflies are, this has become a great ecotourism thing. Uh, if you walk through the uh, place where the butterflies are hibernating, they'll actually get up and flap around. Come spring, they start migrating north to come back to us. And uh, the first batch might come like north to Texas in March or something, lay some eggs, the caterpillars, and always on milkweed species, the caterpillars uh, turn into adults, and they continue the migration north to maybe Connecticut. We see them coming into Connecticut, maybe the 15th of May, I've recorded them. And from there, they do the same thing. They complete a life cycle and their progeny take off for Canada or uh, Northern New England. I've seen them up in Prince Edward Islands and stuff. And so you have these, these uh, this, there is the instinct in this species to continue this Northern migration through several generations. And then uh, all of a sudden in September uh, with some temperature cue or something, they turn around and all the monarchs on the East Coast all start heading south back to the uh, transverse range in Mexico. Uh, if you go out on your lawn on a good monarch year and you go out on your lawn on a beautiful September day, you can lay down on your lawn and look up. And sometimes it looks like spaghetti flying over way up in the sky, orange. Uh, butterflies way up there that you can hardly make out. It's really a, a wonderful phenomenon. But what's really wonderful is how the instinct is in this butterfly and passed through several generations to continue this migration. I mean, how does the one that's in Tennessee, grows up in Tennessee, how does that know to come to Connecticut? And how does the one in Connecticut know to turn around in September and go back to central Mexico? I mean, it's really a tremendous phenomenon. Again, you know, the bird people talk about migration going from the North Pole to the South part of South America. Okay, that's really cool. I can't knock it. But I mean, the monarch migration is just an unbelievable phenomenon. If you look out on the West Coast, uh, there are monarch butterflies out on the West Coast, and they have a similar uh, migration pattern, except they uh, go uh, to the coast of California. And to you who've been to Monterey, California, Pacific Grove, there's a special place where the monarchs gather in Pacific Grove. The uh, California population of monarchs as the East Coast uh, population have both been declining, but uh, California monarchs had a, had a bounce back last year. So we're hoping that uh, you know people paying more attention and managing the landscape and uh, we might see the monarchs return to their glory in our time. Um, so let's see. Here they are uh, migrating uh, into the sky, into the distant sky, and they're going to Mexico. Those butterflies you see going through nectaring, stopping for nectar at your uh, backyard, they're on their way to Mexico. And the one thing, you know, you got to think about this. If you can go from Prince Edward Islands in Canada to central Mexico, you've got to be tough. And, you know, people go on about butterflies. Oh, they're so delicate. They're not. Most of them are not that delicate and things like monarchs are not delicate at all. When I give butterfly walks, I take a monarch and I squish it in my hands and it, you know, all everybody wants to beat me up with their handbags, but uh, then I open my hand and the butterfly just flies away. These things are like rubber, I'll tell you. They are really tough. 
And of course, if you're going, like I said, from Prince Edward Island to Mexico, you gotta be tough. No pansy's gonna do that. Here's the caterpillar, a beautiful caterpillar. And this caterpillar is very showy. Uh, you know, birds love caterpillars, high protein to feed their young. But this caterpillar is just hanging out, having bright colors, not afraid of getting eaten. And the reason why is the caterpillar is feeding on the milkweed plants and the milkweeds are poisonous plants. If you break open a milkweed, you see little milk coming out. That's a, uh, a perizidine alkaloid and it's very poisonous. Uh, if you eat that, you're gonna get very sick. Experiments with birds that were fed these caterpillars or fed the adult butterflies got very sick, vomited, and then would not touch them again with good reason. Uh, milkweeds were used in colonial times uh, for uh, heart disease and stuff. That, uh, they would use it, you know, to get your heart going, I guess, or something. Um, but it, so it was medicinally used, uh, but it's a very uh, poisonous plant. So I wouldn't suggest uh, sampling it unless you know what you're doing. So here it is, here's a uh, butterfly weed, which is one of the species of milkweed that we are gonna have available if anybody's interested. And the, uh, not only does the plant provide the food plant for the caterpillars, but it also provides a great nectar source for the adults, uh, monarch butterflies and other uh, insects. And you can see uh, the butterfly on the right, uh, not the butterfly, there's an insect, uh, uh, I think it's a, a a uh, true bug is in there uh, going around, get, getting that really rich nectar, uh, very rich uh, food source. Uh, and it's a deal, you know, the plants are making a deal with the pollinators. You get nectar if you do the job of carrying the pollen from one flower to the other. And uh, that's the deal. So it's a kind of an evolutionary deal between the uh, two types of organisms. Now, uh, one of the things that's happened, I want to shift and start thinking about our meadow and what we're going to do to take care of it. And one of the problems, if you're a meadow keeper like me, uh, you, is invasive plants, plants you don't want there. And here is a, uh, here is a uh, black swallowwort. This is a plant from Central Asia, kind of like the uh, uh, garlic mustard. And this plant came into my meadow about 1985. I was very excited to see it because, you know, again, it's a new plant. Turned out it's a terrible invader, invader. And within a few years, it had taken over my meadow. You can see its reproductive capacity, unbelievable amounts of seed. It forms a vine. It chokes other plants and makes the tall pollinating plants fall down, unable to reproduce. So it's a real menace if uh, in your meadow. And this is what my meadow looked like after a few years of black swallowwort. We didn't really know uh, what to do. We actually went out there and with hired help, laboriously uh, weeded the entire meadow one year and severely reduced the population to the point where we could get it manageable. But uh, problem, with the, with the black swallowwort, it is also a member of the milkweed family related to the milkweeds that we prize so much in our, in our uh, natural uh, landscape. And monarch butterflies come along and they sense that it's a milkweed. They scratch the plant to see what it is, the female scratch it, and then they lay eggs sometimes on it. So, and those caterpillars that hatch out of those eggs, they starve to death because they cannot eat black swallowwort, although it's in the milkweed family. So this has become a problem. Uh, studies in the University of Rhode Island have shown that about 20, if black swallowwort is readily available in the landscape, about 20% of the eggs laid by uh, monarch butterflies are on black swallowwort. So like the West Virginia white, right, uh, West Virginia white, this is a mistake and uh, it's a mistake with uh, you know, moral consequences for the caterpillars. So we want to definitely get rid of this stuff. And uh, what we did is I called the University of Rhode Island and this is uh, right, you see me there uh, with my hat on and next to me is Lisa from the University of Rhode Island. And she has, uh, she does biological control. And what a biological control is, they went to the central Ukraine and uh, not a place you want to be tomorrow, of course, but uh, they went to the central Ukraine uh, some years ago and they found a moth there 
that actually eats black swallowwort. And after extensive testing, um, they are uh, they started to culture them and release them around uh, New England and up into Canada in places with lots of swallowwort. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, I had lots of swallowwort, so they picked me as a site due to the help of Susan uh, Robinson on the lower right, a wonderful conservation commissioner from the town of Reading who does a lot to pay attention to uh, our natural resources. The woman in the middle, the young, younger lady is uh, uh, Lisa's uh, helper. So she helps set up the uh, uh, biological control. So here, here's the plant. Uh, and you can see this is the way it looks in our meadow. It looks like it's perfect. It's, hardly a bite mark out of it. The only thing I think is eating it at all are some snails. So we wanna see this stuff really fragged. And here it is completely eaten by these caterpillars that they have released. Uh, Lisa, uh, University of Rhode Island has released on our site in a tent. And, and within a short period of time, the cats uh, completely stripped these uh, uh, black swallow warts down. So we were very optimistic and we have not recovered uh, in, in this two subsequent years, adults moths, which is a, a difficult thing to do. Uh, and uh, you have to use black lights and stuff to attract them. So here they are setting up the tent where we uh, let the caterpillars go and they started uh, feeding. So this is, you're in the middle of my meadow in summer, you can see the, the richness of the uh, site. And this is the moth, Hypena opulenta. Not much to write home about, but man, you're just hoping it, you get a lot of them to uh, eat the uh, uh, black swallowwort. If we could have like, and it's very special. It only eats black swallowwort. And we were talking about the aspect that uh, uh, I see someone's raised their hand. You have to ask questions at the end of the show when uh, uh, Jennifer, I think, is going to handle the questions. So we do have some questions, and I will answer questions. But this is uh, this is the cat. And uh, I mean, this is the, 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 the butterfly, uh, opulent, uh, Hypena opulenta. And, uh, you know, we're hoping for, if any of you guys remember the gypsy moth events of the 80s and stuff, when they just absolutely took over the landscape. Oh, uh, I just wish we could have that for, uh, for Hypena on uh, black swallowwort. Anyway, it's a biological control and the beauty of it, uh, they tested this on hundreds of plants, didn't eat anything but black swallowwort. So. Uh, that's the way a biological control works. Uh, a few biological controls have been very, very successful. Uh, now, uh, our wetlands have been overrun by a bunch of uh, uh, these invasive plants. Uh, probably our greatest loss in our biodiversity in Connecticut is in our wetlands, where we have things like Phragmites invading. So let's look at a few of those. This is the Baltimore checker spot, uh, a butterfly that was always rare in Connecticut but was in my meadow, one of the ones I found in the early years that I was living in my dog. So, um, you know, we're, uh, uh, we're sad to see this one go. We haven't seen it around uh, Fairfield County in, in some years now. And it is, the, it is a partially the victim of Phragmites. This is, a, uh, you know, the C Connecticut Department of Transportation wildflower. Wherever they disturb the edge of the road, and it's got the slight wetness, you get these uh, European rushes growing. This is a plant that's native to the uh, Danube Delta. And it's, it's, it's useful in Europe for thatching huts and stuff like that. But in Connecticut is, I mean, in the United States is become a runaway pest. So uh, this is a plant we'd love to see uh, brought under control by a biological control. Another one, a really beautiful plant is, uh, uh, oh, uh, hold on. Let me look. I'm having a senior moment here. Uh, purple loose strife. This is purple loose strife. Uh, this came in. Uh, again, I remember as a kid driving up to Hudson, driving across 84 up to the Catskills and all the beautiful wetlands along uh, Route 84. And gradually, purple loose strife came in and uh. Uh, just took them over. So they're a beautiful purple when this thing flowers. It's popular with gardeners. And so gardeners putting it in garden, gardens has spread this plant very quickly around the United States. Uh, and it's everywhere. We urge gardeners not to grow it. Um, 
The University of Connecticut released a biological control back in the early 90s to try to control this. And the beetles, it's two species of beetles and they have taken and they are findable. I think we're seeing a reduction in purple loosestrife. Uh, problem is as a nectar source, you know, you don't, you don't see many uh, insects nectaring at this. So although it looks like it'd be a good nectar source, turns out, I don't think it is, but uh, this is another one that it, it clogs our uh, wetlands and moist edges. Now, uh, I wanna leave the uh, aspect of uh, invasive plants behind and, and talk a little about the history of uh, entomology and, uh, uh, and bring that into focus in my uh, meadow and some of the biological things that just thrill me out, out back. This is uh, Henry Bates and he was a wonderful naturalist and he wrote the book uh, uh, about, he was on the Amazon River for 10 years in 1840 and made a huge collection. And on the way back to Europe, the, uh, the, the ship sunk or something and he lost his whole collection. But he, he, and, he and to read his book uh, uh, along the Amazon is, is amazing. I mean, the guy got so sick and suffered so bad. He lived in the forest, and, but uh, really made great contributions to uh, natural history and biological science. And uh, the reason I'm bringing him up here is that uh, his, he kept extensive journals of his studies. And these have just been published a few, right pre-pandemic, uh, these, they started to publish these. I think it was the British Museum. So if you're interested in natural history, pick up some of the things written by Bates and also uh, the versions of his uh, journals that are available. Absolutely beautiful artistic stuff. This is where art and science really start to go together. Let's see. Uh, Okay, now, you know, Bates, uh, Bates was one of the fronts to really uh, bring the diversity of the tropics into focus. And I put this uh, up again, this is uh, my uh, collection from my meadow. My spouse and I put this together. Uh, this is the property of the Peabody Museum now, but I keep it for demonstration purposes. And this has about half the Connecticut fauna, about 50, 50 species. And it took me 40 years to assemble this. So, you know, I mean, some of the butterflies, a lot of them aren't there every year. They come through, they're uh, intermediate. Sometimes uh, their populations in the South burst out and they come North. Some years they don't have population. So you gotta be around if you wanna see, catch every butterfly. Not that I'm, I'm not really doing a lot of collecting nowadays, but uh, this was uh, the project in our, in our field. And uh, okay, so we're going to the tropics. This, this, this caterpillar is uh, misplaced. This is the monarch caterpillar and it's uh, munching on some milkweed. Okay, and this is one of the things that Bates, uh, Henry Bates discovered and it's named after him. It's called Batesian mimicry. And in mimicry, we have at the top the monarch butterfly. Now, as I just showed you, that monarch caterpillar is feeding on the poisonous milkweed. And as a result, the monarch itself is a poisonous butterfly. Um, you know, in, when I was in college, I'd eat a moth or two at a party to maybe win some beer money on a double dare. And uh, I never would eat a monarch because you will get really, really sick if you eat a monarch. You got to know your bugs if you're going to eat bugs for, uh, you know, for that kind of game. Now, below that is another butterfly called the Viceroy. And the Viceroy is perfectly tasty. You can eat all of them you want. Uh, a, a wonderful entomologist, Lincoln Brower, uh, who did a lot of research on the monarch butterflies, and I got to know at the Peabody, Peabody Museum. Uh, he was the one who first, in a classic scientific paper in Scientific American, I think in the late 50s, was the first to take monarchs and feed them to caged blue jays. And he would start by feeding the uh, viceroys down below and the, you know, the, the uh, uh, birds were just really, really loving them and gobbling. And then he would feed them a monarch and they would get really sick and vomit. And then they would not ever, ever, never touch a viceroy again. So the viceroy, by looking like the monarch, gets protection. It's a protected species. Uh, and the monarch is considered aposematic, which means that it's poisonous. 
and the butterfly down below is a Batesian mimic named after our biologist, Henry Bates, because he really first started to suspect this relationship uh, when he was down in the uh, Amazon. He noticed the relationships among butterflies and saw that they started to talk about this um, uh, mimicry aspect, which is really a fascinating uh, aspect of uh, biology. Now, uh, it turns out, and this is right, and again, you know, you have this right in our backyards in Reading. Uh, you have that monarch uh, viceroy thing going on. We often get viceroys at our summer butterfly count in uh, um, Cross Meadow, Cross Highway Meadow, which is a wonderful butterfly spot, one of the top butterfly spots in Western Connecticut. And uh, you find that this phenomena of, of Batesian mimicry is not only in butterflies. Here on the right, you have a, a wasp, a yellow jacket that can give you a horrific sting multiple times. And on the left, you have an absolutely harmless hoverfly. Again, you could catch a hoverfly and munch it, no problem. Uh, the last time a wasp got in my mouth, it stung me and I ended up in Norwalk Hospital for six hours before they uh, got my throat down to, uh, you know, dependable air passage. So uh, they called that the stung in the tongue uh, incident. And uh, here we have a, uh, a wasp and you can tell the wasp because it has a long antenna and it has a stinger that you can often see. And uh, there's aspects of the wings. Wasps have four wings and flies have two wings. And look at the antennas. They're very short. And uh, unlike the wasp, they have uh, very short antennas and they have only two wings. So if you're out in your field, uh, or if you come on one of my butterfly walks, we'll try to identify these so you can separate them. But I wanna say that these hoverflies, as they're called, uh, which uh, mimic wasps, are absolutely wonderful uh, creatures and doing their share of pollination. So people that don't like flies uh, get over it, you know? Okay, so let's see here uh, if I can go on. And not only in this Batesian mimic, Marie, not only do uh, flies get into the uh, game mimicking those wasps that can sting you, uh, but also beetles. And here's a longhorn beetle. And this beetle is, a mimic, is in the mimicry complex. Uh, it's maybe not so obvious here that it's a mimic of a wasp, but when you run across these things in the field with the flowers and stuff, and, and you'll see that it is a, uh, it is, it is a very, you know, you're not going to just grab it and see if it's a wasp or not, if it stings you. Believe me, you'll, you'll, you'll give it wide berth. And these are, uh, this, this beetle is fairly common around Reading. Uh, with a little effort, you can find it uh, every summer. Now, you know, one of the things we're doing is here, we got to really start thinking about our environment seriously. Uh, I'm getting away from the idea of just talking about cl climate change, but the organisms that, that are in our environment. And we really need a very serious change in the way we think about insects. And I, used, I like to use birds as the model for that because here we go back to 1900 and the Christmas bird hunt, okay? And you'd go out and here's a fancy lady with a shotgun blasting away every little bird she could find. And there's pictures uh, in archives from this phenomena, the Christmas bird hunt. And sides of the barns are covered with all the little birds you could imagine, 100, 150 birds, tits and, um, you know, wrens and whatever they could blast. And, you know, it was really horrible and people were getting horrified about it. And birds were going extinct because women were using the feathers for their hairs and for their hats and stuff. She's got some fancy, this lady has some fancy feathers in her hair. So the Christmas bird count, bird hunt caused a lot of, um, you know, people were getting angry about it and they were starting to pay attention to keep keeping birds around. And that's when they came up with the Christmas bird count. And so every year, if you happen to know some birders, uh, they go out around Christmas time and they try to find all the birds they can. So this was very nice how this uh, segged from the hunt into the count. And uh, we've done similar in uh, butterflies. We have a, an annual butterfly count here in Reading where we go to all our nice meadows and count the, all the butterflies that we see. We usually have about three or 400 butterflies on a July day with probably 20 to 30 different species of butterflies. 
Okay, so that bird count really put a, a massive strain on the uh, bird populations. And, uh, you know, people got wise and with the bird count, uh, uh, birds were taken, you know, taken into a little more safety. I mean, you can imagine today, if you were had a hundred uh, bird, little birds hanging on the side of your barn, people would come at you and beat you up, you know, but uh, that was okay. So here we have, this is the, this is the insect, this is an apocalypse for insects, the, the uh, uh, zapper. Oh, I, you know, this thing really gets me uh, aggravated. People put these up, these indiscriminately kill all the flying insects at night. And the studies that have been done, people have done studies in scientific journals and the bugs they find zapped in bug zappers, none of them are the ones that are really harshing our mellow. So these things are just needlessly killing uh, insects that could be pollinators. Uh, incidentally, a lot of pollinating goes on at night. When we've gone out and done sampling on flowers at night, you'd be surprised uh, what's flying around. So, um, you know, these bug zappers, we really got to get a new attitude towards, uh, you know, just indiscriminately murdering every bug we can find. Uh, we got to worry about invasive plants. This is a, this was a beautifully diverse wetland that uh, uh, has been taken over by the European uh, rush, Phragmites, and is now a solid stand of, uh, of, of, of uh, Phragmites. So we're hoping we find a biological control for this, some bug we can let go that'll eat this thing. Okay, and this is a healthy meadow. This is what you want your meadow to look diverse. Lots of that uh, goldenrod in August is loaded with pollinators. This is the uh, meadow at Crossfields, a wonderful place that we managed to uh, save from development when I was on the Conservation Commission years ago, and has really become special in Reading as uh, people are lawning uh, our town indiscriminately. Okay, and you can see the comparison Here's a lawn. Now, I mean, I don't know, you know, what is this lawn doing? I've gone out and done sampling. I can't find any insects on lawns. Uh, and, you know, what they're doing is they're pouring a lot of chemicals and stuff on the lawns. And they're also not allowing any flowers to grow. There's no nectar sources there to attract uh, insects. So this is uh, really a uh, thing that's been going on that is not only costing us a lot of money and effort, but also it's actually doing a very bad thing to our environment. Uh, last year, we were uh, doing insect sampling on dandelion. Now, you know, I know a lot of homeowners and lawn owners love, uh, hate dandelion, but the uh, Ridgefield uh, Library has uh, uh, let their dandelions grow. So they had a nice little field of dandelions growing in the middle of Ridgefield. And we went up there, my spouse and I, Rowan, and we could not find any insects on the dandelions. We went to our lawn, which we've been letting grow. We let it grow to mid-August before we cut it. Uh, and there's some dandelions there and they were loaded with uh, it, you know, bees, wild bees and stuff uh, pollinating. So, uh, you know, something's going on there where there's no insects on that, on that lawn. They're putting something on the lawn. And I can't tell you how bad this whole uh, pesticide thing goes. Okay, Roundup, you know, one of the biggest villains. Uh, you know, you can go up to Home Depot and, and, and you see a warehouse full of this stuff. People are buying this stuff and spraying it all around. Probably most of them don't even read the uh, instructions. And, you know, this was in, when I was a, a, a commissioner in Reading. We had, we were putting ball fields in the schools and uh, this parents, Parent groups were very strong about having ball fields. And I think it's great for kids to exercise, but they wanted these pristine ball fields. And I brought up the subject of best pesticides and herbicides. And I asked for a list and they brought a list in and the pesticide they use on in uh, Reading on the ball fields is the same thing that was Ange, uh, Agent Orange in Vietnam. And I just couldn't believe it. And, and when I brought this up to the parents at the meeting, they said that I was a child hater. Well, I had my own kids. I mean, you know, so uh, we really got to start thinking about where we're splashing this stuff all over the place. And uh, when you see a lawn, like I just showed you, there's a lot of uh, probably pesticides going into that. So here's what it looks like when you have a lot of pesticides. This was particularly brought into my uh, view 
when I was down in New Canaan. This guy down in New Canaan has a um, firefly sanctuary. And for about 30 years, he's been growing plants and maintaining the property. It's probably about 10 acres to be a firefly uh, refuge. And you go out, I went out there three years ago in the summer fire flight time, and the place was loaded, loaded with fireflies. I mean, like I had never seen, I thought I had a lot of fireflies on my property. So I was strutting my stuff and boy, that put me in my place. I need that more fireflies. And next to that property was this uh, French chateau type house with an absolute manicured lawn and the owner of the Firefly uh, thing said that Firefly property told me that the neighbor is absolutely dismissive of, you know, not, he wants to manicure totally and he just makes fun of him, you know, drops off bottles of pesticide at his house and everything really aggravates the Firefly guy. So I, uh, I went over to the edge of the property where there's a stone wall that divides this manicured property from the uh, firefly property. The firefly property was loaded with bugs. There, we could not find one or see one on the other side of the uh, stone wall. So this is what pesticides are doing. They are severely reducing our wild populations. Birds that feed on insects are declining very quickly in Connecticut because no bugs, no food. You can feed birds all you want with seeds, but the seeds are not uh, high in protein. And so when it comes time for the birds to nest and reproduce, they need protein to feed their, their little birds. They, don't, they can't get by on seeds. So seeds keep them going in the winter, but you want to really uh, you know, make more for the, uh, uh, for, for the, bird, the insect feeding birds. Here's a, a bird house on our property. This is just going around my property a little bit. You can see turning off to the side. And here I am, this is uh, letting it grow, I call this. And I let my lawn go every year until August. And then I cut it to be, you know, I, I cut it long, but I leave it as a, uh, as a lawn then because it's, uh, it, it doesn't have that many flowers. The main flowering is in May and June and I'm getting all sorts of wild bees and butterflies and stuff coming back to my lawn. So uh, one of my projects that uh, I really think is a good thing that we can all do. This, is, this was just, when I moved into this dog years ago, this lawn looked just like some of those other lawns uh, we're looking at uh, that I just showed you. And uh, I'm, one of the things I'm doing to increase the wild bees is I'm making bee houses. And just like you can make bird houses, you can make bee houses. And uh, this I made out of some uh, uh, column, some, some decorative wood that was left over from a job that I got out of a dumpster. And uh, uh, the, the bees and the wasps come along and they, uh, they stick their larva in these little tubes and they plaster it up with dirt. I'm sure you've seen this in your house, uh, on your house with holes getting filled up and it can be a bit of aggravation, but uh, in your field, it's a good thing. And here's a uh, really spectacular, uh, probably uh, a, a little, what we call little green bees in entomology, not trying to be funny, but these things go into these tubes and they lay their larva and then they seal it up with mud. So you gotta have a good supply of mud around for these things to successfully uh, seal it up. And then the following year, a little uh, green metallic bee will grow out of there. These metallic bees have come back to my front lawn in force and they are absolutely spectacular. If you can take yourself down to the you know, level to look at small things, uh, you'll get an eyeful, absolutely wonderful creatures. Okay, and this is, gives you an idea of the wild bees. This is a, some of the wild bees we have in Connecticut. On the far right, you see the, uh, uh, you see the metallic, little metallic green bees. And right below that, you see a very much yellow jacket-like looking bee, but it's not a yellow jacket. It's actually a, uh, uh, I think that's a bee. Um, you can tell usually by looking at the legs, the legs have a fattening in the legs for collecting pollen, the scopa. Okay, so I just want to talk a little about my, uh, I'm not always in my meadow, especially today, I wasn't out there. So in the meantime, I've had a, a company named uh, Monarch Painting. And uh, our motto was metamorphosis our business. We've done, uh, I'm, not, I'm really retired now, but I did some marvelous projects uh, all over the United States. 
and uh, tons in Fairfield County, which is one of the best places to be a decorative painter. And I'll show you one thing we did. Here we are at the lab at the Peabody Museum. Victor, you've muted yourself. Yeah, I know. I'm okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, I'm almost finished here. So, uh, okay, so here was that uh, lab at the Peabody. Uh, I love the monarch butterfly, so I got loose here and uh, children and dogs and butterflies. What, you know, who can't like that, right? I uh, teach workshops for children. I love working with children. Uh, it's like sticking your finger in a electric socket. Their enthusiasm is so infectious. This group, uh, we did, uh, this was at the Ridgefield Guild and we did a uh, thing about uh, monarch butterflies, same stick kind of thing with the, with the dachshund and the, and the butterflies. And uh, during the week, while well, we were, just took us a week to do this. And this, these kids come into this class and some of them have never even lifted up a paintbrush. So they're absolutely shocked at the end of the week that they've done this on the wall and their, their parents are equally shocked. And uh, uh, we talk about uh, butterflies. It's a, chance for me to, uh, you know, indoctrinate them into the uh, meadow mentality, what I would say. And the, the end of the week, in this particular uh, mural, the Ridgefield Press showed up and the, the uh, reporter interviewed the girl on the left, uh, Ruby, who's very, very, uh, very articulate person. And she told them all about the life cycle of the monarch butterfly and how we're trying to get make people aware. I was so proud of her, just wonderful. And you see uh, to the right of her is the uh, Emma the Dachshund who had uh, posed for the uh, mural and the, the girls are meeting Emma. Uh, this is on my house in West Reading. So if any of you Reading residents drive by, uh, you'll see this. Uh, this is our monarch butterfly activities. And you know, my wife has felt that I'm carrying the monarch thing a little too far. And when I put it on the barn, that was it. She said, okay, you can't put butterflies on the side of the house. So I didn't know any better, so I did it anyway. But, uh, and this is the meadow where we were, we were spent today, uh, our West Reading Meadow. And uh, this is my daughter when, and her friend when she was a younger girls. And by the end of the summer, this meadow is, is higher than the heads of young women. And, you know, I, I raised my children in Reading and, you know, you do stuff to your children. You thought you were doing the right thing. And years later, you find out as a parent, you really had done the wrong thing. And that came to me recently when my daughter said, you know, dad, it wasn't until I was about 13 that I realized not all families went chasing butterflies on vacation. So here we are in the uh, Schnell Creek range of uh, central Nevada, wonderful place in a in a, mo in a moment's time in a meadow along a stream loaded with pollinators. So the kids are out there being kids. And that's the end of my talk. And uh, this is an unfortunate soul that came on one of my butterfly walks and he had a sweaty brow because it's in the middle of July. And I put this uh, butterfly on his face that I caught with my net and that butterfly started to sip um, the sweat because butterflies like all of us love salt. And this butterfly stayed, well, the rule is with, this is called a butterfly nose job. And the thing is with the butterfly on your head like that, you have to leave it until it's finished. And I think this butterfly stayed on his face about half an hour. So he was getting a little nervous. He wanted to go home after the event. So uh, we are gonna have seeds available uh, of four milkweed species. And uh, if you contact uh, uh, Jennifer or at the, at the library here, she's gonna give you my, um, uh, contact and you can contact me directly and we will get you some seeds. Last year we gave seeds to over 100 uh, individuals in Connecticut and six okay. states. So if you're in a land trust or something, you know, you can get some seeds. Okay. Yeah. So Victor, we are, and Jennifer, we have put the Victor's phone number and his email address into the Q&A. So everyone should be able to see it there. Great, thank you. 
You're welcome. If, if you if you get some seeds, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I will give you this is a instruction sheet helping you uh, get your meadow going. Well, Jennifer, okay. I'll to you. Yeah. Are we ready for questions? I'm ready for questions. Victor, someone asked if you would be able to provide a list of the flowers that you discussed or mentioned. Well, you know, what I would say is that uh, there's a lot of really good books out on butterfly gardening. And um, I actually have one. I will, I could donate to the Mark Twain if someone's interested, but I think you already have some here at the Mark Twain. And I would, I would suggest you go get a, a, a good reference uh, and study that because it's, it's pretty standard fare uh, what's good. And I, I think uh, the information's all over the place. I mean, you can get that on computer also. Um, so I have not made up a list from all the plants in our meadow. Uh, and our meadow is not all the plants because there's lots of other plants too. So that's what I would suggest to do the research on Google and, uh, and at the library. Good suggestion. Someone asked, uh, an anonymous person asked, um, how many generations does it take for a population to get from Mexico to Maine? This is. Uh, I think, I, think uh, I cannot answer that exactly, uh, but I think it takes four generations to get from Mexico to Prince Edward Islands. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then the person wondered how long it would be in the reverse. Is it basically the same each direction? No, no. The ones going south, like the ones that are up in Prince Edward Island and the ones that are in Connecticut and the ones that are in Tennessee, they all go back to Mexico. They don't do any oh, exit wow. along the way. Mm -hmm. that they're, they're done. They're done having their kids and uh, they're, they're back to Mexico. So, and it's interesting if you, if you catch a uh, monarch, uh, migrating uh, they're they're full of fat uh, and and they're they turn absolutely black if you hold them for any period of time you know like a couple of days they'll they they they, they get this greasiness to them that's really different from uh, monarchs the other time of year last year in reading i did monarch watch which is a national organization where you tag monarchs with little tags and let them go unharmed and then someone might see that monarch someplace else, like in Tennessee or West Virginia or something. So in this way, we've really managed to, uh, you know, flesh out a lot about the migration of the monarch by all these people. And it's a great citizen scientist thing to do. So if you're a bit of a naturalist, uh, look up Monarch Watch and get involved with them. It's really a good dynamic uh, thing that's going on. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. And, and just to just to add to that, uh, you know, I I've, I've been interested in monarchs for years, but last year I was like specifically out there in September anticipating migration. And one Sunday, my God, just tons of monarchs showed up and they were all over the place. And then the next day you couldn't find a monarch. So it just came through like a, a wave. And, uh, you know, we do everything to keep our meadow nectar happy. And my neighbor who has a lot of fields adjo adjoining my property, he has one field that is full of butterfly weed and all the monarchs were there. There were none on my property. So I was like really aggravated. You know, I had to go hang out on his property to uh, tag all the monarchs. So it doesn't always work out the way you want it to. A little competitiveness. Uh, Michael Russo wondered if there was a way to obtain the eggs or the larva of what's H. opulenta? Oh, I don't know. You, uh, you know, we're working with the University of Rhode Island and uh, they would not, they brought out uh, caterpillars in like the third instar growth phase, maybe second instar, I forget. No, no, actually, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 they brought out adult female caterpillars, uh, butterflies, moths in that case, moths, and we released them into the uh, cage after the cage was constructed and very carefully uh, tied to the ground so that none of them could. So they laid eggs right on the uh, black swallow wart. And then uh, the black swallow wart, uh, you know, they ate the, the, the ones in the cage, ate the black swallow wart to ribs 
destroyed it, but we haven't seen them in the two years since. Doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, in, in Ottawa, I think the Ottawa release, Canada, they have been getting now uh, recapturing, uh, uh, capturing uh, moths in subsequent years. So we're hopeful that this, this biological control is gonna take, uh, but sometimes it takes a while. So we don't know how to anticipate it yet. Well, Michael Russo, who asked this question, said North Guilford is overrun with swallower and Gallows Hill Road is overrun with swallower. And it is really difficult to dig out and pull out. Yes. You know, the best you can do, I think, is just a lot of times pull off the seed pods before they you know, right. explode. Right. Well, it's uh, this is a big problem around Connecticut. And if you want to see black swallow work, well, we, we've we've gotten ours down to control level. Uh, but, um, you know, it's it's really awful. That's all um, I'm going to say. We have a question from Catherine Whitaker. She asks, how are we sure that uh, the ovulite will not become an invasive? The what? What is hypena, the hypena yeah. ovulate? Well, hypena was extensively tested on uh, different species of plants and it found it was only, I mean, they did, they worked on the, uh, the moth for 10 years in Rhode Island in greenhouses and stuff before they decided that it was cleared for release. That is a concern that we would introduce a pest species and that's like the gypsy moth was introduced in order to make silk and it was it just got out and became the terrific pest that it is. So yes, we are concerned about that, but as far as we know about hypena, uh, it looks like it's a specialist and it's not going anywhere but where black swallow work goes. So, but there's been problems with releases, that's for sure. Jay Bandery um, says, Asclepias butterfly weed, are they similar to the milkweed plant the caterpillars chew on? I didn't understand your question. I'm, I'm, well, I'm leaning in here because I can't hear very well. What? Okay. He's talking, he's asking if uh, Asclepias butterfly weed, are they similar to the milkweed plant the caterpillars chew on to form their pupa? The, the four milkweed plants I discussed tonight not yeah. black swallowwort, which is a, a you know it's milkweed family, but not Aschlepius. The four that I spoke about, which were native Aschlepius, all act as food plants for uh, monarch butterflies, and uh, they seem to really like uh, butterfly weed. They, they, they swamp milkweed they do great on too. So, uh, you know, one of the interesting asides I've been studying this biology for a while. And they found in, uh, at the University of Rhode Island where they do a lot of research like this, that mowing the fields halfway through the growing season, like July, uh, cuts down all the uh, milkweed while it's starting to flower. That mm -hmm. a lot of that milkweed comes back and that the milkweed comes back as smaller plants. And what happens with that is that the monarch butterflies prefer the new small plants to the older plants to lay their eggs because the new plants, while they're growing, have to develop the chemical that the, uh, the perizidine alkaloid that the uh, monarchs take from the plant. But the point is, is that the plants don't have as much poison in them. And so they're better eating, something like that. Um, also, a, a part, second part of this question, do the caterpillars after they finish eating go to another plant to form their chrysalis? But I guess there's no they way. They will to, if they have to. If, they're know, no they're, they, if they don't have to walk, they don't, you know, I think they're pretty lazy. But, uh, and I'll tell you one thing, if you're trying to grow milkweed, one of the big problems about milkweed is that if you're putting in first year plants and you got cats around, those cats are gonna find those plants and they're gonna eat them to nubs and those plants won't make it through the winter. So uh, you gotta protect your little milkweeds uh, if you want them to get established. Do you get any pushback from your neighbors for not cutting your lawn? Uh, okay. No, but one, an entomologist I knew in uh, Massachusetts years ago, he tried to wild his lawn and he was in a subdivision 
and uh, he was getting like death threats and everything. People get really worked up about it. And, uh, you know, this reestablishing native, uh, native uh, vegetation, uh, you know, doesn't really sit well with the chemical companies that are making vast sums selling fertilizer and pesticides and everything else. So uh, this is a, uh, you know, this is, this is a, not a friendly situation necessarily. They don't want to see stuff go back to meadows and stuff. Someone said, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Can you tell us what plants attract green bees and also how you are doing with invasive control on your property? Okay, you're asking me what bees like what? What plants attract green bees? Green bees? Yes. Like those little green bees that I had there? Yes. Oh, I was finding them on my lawn, uh, the uh, flea bane that was growing on my lawn, which is incidentally considered a terrible lawn invader by lawn lovers. So, uh, you know, that's, but that's, uh, that has a lot of green bees on it. And they're, they're common around. There's four, I think four species in Connecticut, something like that. And uh, I've found several on my property. So, uh, and the bee houses uh, are good for increasing your uh, wild bee populations. Then what was the second part of your question? How are you doing with invasive control on your property? Pretty good. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. I mean, this is, you have to love doing this. I don't love invasives, but uh, you know, it's, I, I love being out there in the meadow. I find such uh, solace and, and fulfillment working in, in my meadow and uh, it's a wonderful place. And when I see butterflies when I'm out there and I'm down in the shrubs and the grass and stuff and butterflies fly up to me, I just, I'm so happy. Uh, we've completely eliminated wild rose, which is a problem. And we've taken a couple of other invasives completely out. A uh, garlic mustard is, it's, there's a lot of it, but it's really easy to weed if you're doing it in, in uh, May or April when the ground is wet, the whole root system just comes out. So we've really controlled uh, garlic mustard a lot. Uh, we're still having a fight with swallowwort, but we've got it down to manageable proportions, but it takes a lot of work and you've got to uh, love doing this stuff, but you know, that's the way it is. Someone asked if you can grow pollinator plants in pots. Yes. In fact, in downtown Paris now, they have a big program to grow. Well, first of all, uh, oh, let me, uh, uh, first of all, um, not a lot of the flowers you buy at nurseries and stuff are pollinator friendly because they've been bred, their naturalness has been bred out of them. So uh, that's why you got to work with native plants if you want to increase these wild bee populations and stuff. Now in Paris, they have a big program. Uh, any of you who've been to Europe, you might remember everybody putting flower boxes on their windows. One of the beautiful things about going to a European city. And they're really um, promoting the uh, you know wild and, and domestic bee populations by planting on places like fire escapes and windows and stuff like that. Slovenia has a very intensive uh, bee uh, program and, and, and using urban areas as nectar sources by you know, controlling what's being planted and everything. Uh, there's some, some, uh, some indication that uh, things like oak trees, which we think are mostly wind pollinated are also uh, having some insects work on them. And I just saw that New York City is going to plant like I don't know what a million or two million trees or something. So that's going to that's the kind of program that could bring not only shade and, and hospitality hospitality to the city, but also pollinators. So and again, we have to have the right attitude. You know, we can't have that uh, Christmas bird hunt that I was talking about. Sandy Martin asked, "What kind of butterfly was on that the man's face?" Butterfly what? What kind of butterfly was on the man's face? That's a that's a tiger swallowtail. That's my favorite butterfly. And I, for 23 years, I uh, chased 
Tiger swallowed tails around and uh, marked them. So let me see. Uh, I just have a few more slides here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't have my. Oh, here it is. This is uh, this is from my mark recapture. In a uh, 23 year period, I marked about seven and a half thousand swallowtails. And and what I was doing with the swallowtails is that uh, swallowtails are big bird food, and the birds attack the swallowtail, and the swallowtail shakes loose, and the bird rips off a portion of its wings. So by studying the amount of damaged wings, you could start to figure out, you know, the catalog, the predation uh, by birds upon those butterflies. And in order to do that, you have to mark the butterfly. So I would catch these butterflies for about a six week period during the summer, and I would put a number on them and, uh, and, and then recapture them. And this is how I studied the population and did that 7,000 times. That is How are we doing on time, Elaine? We are probably need to take maybe another one or two questions. And okay, uh, here's a good one. Um, do butterflies, birds, or insects eat ticks? Eat what? Ticks. And what can we do to get ticks in our yard eaten up? What are they eating? I I can't hear. Ticks. Ticks. Spell that. T I C K S. Oh, no, butterflies don't eat ticks. Uh, turkeys eat ticks, from what I hear. Uh, ticks have doing uh, massive amounts of field work for me, uh, both maintaining my meadow and, uh, and, uh, and uh, marking and catching butterflies to releasing them. Uh, you have a lot of tick exposure. Uh, fortunately, the kind of low tick point trough is in the middle of the summer. So your worst tick times are in the spring and the fall. You can get a tick on you in January if it's, you know, 50 degrees or 50 degrees out. Uh, real problem in Connecticut ticks. Uh, anybody who works with me, I refuse to take them out in the field unless they do, uh, you know, tick preparation and stuff. When I showed a picture of me and Lucas at the beginning of the talk, you notice Lucas had his socks around his uh, pants and you know, a young guy came out, young kid came out with me and started doing field work. And, uh, oh, no, they're not going to get me. And uh, we scared the hell out of them. And I told, I told them, you're not coming anywhere with me unless you take care of yourself. So I'm very tick minded. Uh, what is a good host plant for the yellow swallowtail? What is a good nectar plant host for a swallowtail? Plant. Host plant. The host plant with the tiger swallowtails, the host plants are tulip tree and black uh, black cherry, which are both common trees in our forested and, and, and edge of forest areas. The pipe vine swallowtail feeds on uh, Dutchman's pipe, which I gave you a lot of talk about. The spice bush swallowtail feeds on spice bush and um, sassafras. And the, uh, the um, Carrot swallowtail feeds on carrots. So you can get those in your garden. I mean, every year I hear from someone who's got some swallowtails eating their carrots, the big, big uh, striped uh, caterpillars uh, munching away. Okay, our last question uh, from Carrie Markey. If you could tell people to do just one thing to start protecting pollinators, what would you tell them to do? Stop spraying pesticides. Mm -hmm. We're poisoning ourselves poisoning ourselves, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that there's been such a cover up as to what this is doing to people and the exposure. And in the town of Reading, when they were gonna use this Agent Orange on these ball fields and expose young children who are much more susceptible to developing cancer than older people because they're still in a developmental phase of their bodies. I, I was just aghast. And I mean, we have so many smart people in this state and they're doing such idiotic things. So, uh, I mean, I would say, urge your legislators to ban nic uh, nic toys. Just to give you a real fast one on this, you know, they thought they were solving the problem when they banned DDT. And the farmers made a big stink about it at the time. And they said, well, we gotta have something. 
So what they allowed, they got rid of DDT, but they allowed these, uh, this group called uh, glycophosphates. And the problem with glycophosphate pe uh, pesticides, they are soluble in water. So they are all over the place. And you can get, you can find, uh, I mean, look at birds in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that nests on islands are having low sperm counts. I mean, that gives you an idea of how this stuff is working th st through our environment. Now things come back. I mean, we stopped doing the uh, DDT and the ops sprays came back big time. All their eggs were collapsing and they stopped DDT and they started coming back. So I think that, you know, we can bring the pollinators back too. We just got to quit doing the, what we're doing, which is so mindless. Well, um, I think, thank you. Thank you for just such a wonderful presentation. Yes, thank you, Victor and Jennifer. Thank you for the Garden Club for bringing this yes. to us this evening. And we are available later on for seeds uh, and Jennifer is going to be helping me do that. And we want to be thinking about those warm, sunny summer days tonight, especially. <laughs>